You're listening to Miss Style, Strength, and Grace with Deidre Murphy. This is your one-stop shop for style, fashion, health, and fitness. Deidre's passion is to help empower women to reach their fullest potential, both inside and out. Deidre and her guests will be discussing how to develop your style, health, and lifestyle hacks to energize your day and inspire you to keep reaching higher levels of success. Deidre is a professional fashion stylist, health guru, and Mrs. Washington 2017. It's time to get open and honest with Deidre. Well, hello and welcome listeners of the Miss Style, Strength, and Grace podcast podcast. I am very eager for you to listen to today's guest. Her name is Shri Sani and she is our reigning Miss India USA. Shri is a very inspirational young woman who has overcome insurmountable challenges at a very young age. At the age of 12, Shri's heart stopped working and had a pacemaker implantation surgery to keep her alive. She was told that she could never dance again or or live a normal life, but she continued to be active both as a student and train as a competitive dancer. Shri is an accomplished student who has studied at three Ivy League universities, which are Harvard, Stanford, and Yale, and she helps other str- others struggling with heart defects, and she hopes to inspire millions around the world. Shri writes wisdom nuggets in top five newspapers across the country on the values of emotional fitness. She's written over 300 articles in the newspaper and raised more than $200,000 to help end world trafficking or human trafficking, excuse me. Her next goal, Shri is preparing to go onto the world stage and compete at Miss India Worldwide amongst 50 other countries. So I first met Shri about a year ago at a Mrs. Washington rehearsal as she was not competing. She's not married, but her mom was competing with me at Mrs. Washington last spring and she attended the rehearsal with her mom and I got to know and chat with Shri for a little bit and I was instantly taken by her kindness, her warmth of her spirit and I felt like I said, an instant connection with her. And she told me about how she was a student at University of Washington and she was getting ready to compete again in an upcoming pageant. She told me her story of having open heart surgery at the age of 12 and how it's impacted not only her life, but her platform and her mission to inspire others. So Sheree, with all that being said, hello and welcome (laughs) to the podcast. Hello, thank you so much for having me and thanks so much for that lovely introduction. I'm super excited to do this interview. Yeah, me too. So why don't we just dive in and can you give my listeners a little bit of a snapshot of your daily life? All right, so um, my daily day-to-day life is very different every day. Um, Just yesterday, I was with the mayor of Renton and I had a great time with him and something really magical happened that I'll talk about later. (laughs) And then today I had an interview this morning at University of Washington and now I'm being interviewed by Mrs. Washington. How cool is that? (laughs) So (laughs) a day in the life of Miss India USA, everybody. (laughs) Yeah. So I feel really fortunate. I've been wanting to do pageants since I was a little girl. Like I was three years old and I remember telling my teacher since kindergarten that I want to be Miss Universe or Miss this, Miss that. Um, So to finally get a title seems like a dream come true, and I'm just so fortunate that I get to make my humble difference in this world and um, get to speak truth in girls and boys and, you know, even men and women um, who might feel like they're, like, trying to achieve their goals, but there's an obstacle in front of them, so just trying to help them reach their goal and reach their potential and overcome that obstacle. So I I feel really fortunate and thankful. Well, that leads essentially to my first question, because I wanted to share your Mm -hmm. story about overcoming a huge obstacle. You had a pacemaker installed at age 12. So tell us a little about about that experience and, you know, what that taught Mm -hmm. you at such a young age. Yeah, so I was just 12 years old, and I remember that day very clearly. I went to the hospital with my mom, and it was a normal physical checkup, like a routine checkup you need for sports, and I was a very active kid. Um, I remember the year before I did cross country, and then this was the year um, I moved to this 
town that had dance and I needed to get a physical for dance. And um, so I was really excited, looking forward to it. And in that physical, my doctor felt the pulse of my heart and he told me um, that your heart is beating 20 beats per minute and a normal, normal heart rate is 70 beats per minute. So how in the world have you been doing cross country? How have you, like he kept asking questions if I've ever, ever passed out and I never had felt any of those symptoms. The only thing, thing I remember um, is always being really exhausted um, and that's because I, I, I believe that was because I just did so much, but that was not true. It was because every five seconds there would be a heartbeat inside of every second or more than, you know, um, and in less than two months I got a pacemaker and, um, physically it was very tough cause, um, you have a new machine in your body and your body's trying to understand how to live a normal life again. And my doctors also told me I could not do dance. So I went for a physical for dance and they said, you can't even do contact sports nor dance. So that really shook me. And I kind of didn't take that diagnosis um, into reality because I envisioned my life where I was active and I was dancing. So step by step, I kept taking extra classes and, um, but honestly, Deidre, it was not the physical aspect that was tough. It was the emotional aspect because a lot of, a lot of girls at dance, they just, I don't know why they just maybe felt threatened by the fact that I was a new girl in the dance studio. They just found a reason to pick, pick, pick on me. And, uh, emotionally it was very tough to, um, have a physical barrier. And then on top of that, um, overcome my emotional challenges with all the things I was going through. Well, and it almost sounds like because your heart was only beating 20 beats per minute prior to the pacemaker, you had maybe trained yourself into just overcoming that physical obstacle of like, oh, I'm already tired, but mm. I'm just going to continue to work through it. Do you think that that helped you on the other side of having the pacemaker installed, of having that grit? Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's a really great insight. <laughs> no one has ever like, I've had so many interviews this year, honestly. Uh, like I've been in 300 newspapers, had over 100 interviews, and no one has ever made that inside. So, um, wow, Dr. Deidre. Um, <laughs> I'll just add yeah. that to my resume, Dr. Deidre. I like that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I guess that is very true. Um, before um, I got the pacemaker, maybe I'd already trained myself having a very busy middle school schedule <laughs> of taking, you know, like starting taking those honors classes, but also doing sports and doing leadership in middle school that, um, I was just used to being active. So that, that probably helped me a lot after that, because I, after getting the pacemaker, because I had that mentality. Um, but I had never, ever experienced that much emotional pain in middle school or leading that into high school. Um, just kids were really cruel to me. And I remember, like crying every day and for a few years. So it was very tough. So I had to um, really be strong in my moral values and never copy anyone's bad behavior and always just choose love. Cause my mom had always taught me that um, my mom actually said a quote to me when I was really young and it said, for, um, it was from Mahatma Gandhi and it said, an eye, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. So you have to be the difference when you're going through something tough and you have to choose kindness because if you just copy someone's bad behavior, there's no difference. And only choosing love and positivity will there be a positive difference. So, I love that. Yeah. Well, and just to give our listeners a little bit of context to what you're talking about, you know, you grew up mm -hmm. in a small town. So you moved to this town of Moses Lake, Washington. If anybody is from Washington, you may have heard of that town so here you are you guys are probably the only Indian family mm -hmm. then you join a dance group and I remember you telling me that there would be days where you would just leave the dance studio in tears because these girls were so mean they were just mean girls to you so mm -hmm. you know what made you want to keep going back you know so many young women especially in a middle school age would have just said you know what? I'm done I'm never stepping foot in that dance studio ever again yeah. they're just all so mean what made you want to keep coming back yeah, well, I loved to dance, and 
I just was so passionate about it. And I knew I, I had to like wait so long so I could dance because before Moses Lake, I was in an even smaller town called Colville, Washington that has about 2,000 people in it. And that, that town is north of Spokane. Um, so I was just waiting all these years to move to the big city, which was <laughs> for Moses Lake for me at that time. Um, where there was a dance studio. Um, and I remember even in Colbo, in my room, I used to just put on like, I don't know if anyone remembers Cheetah Girls or BU. Um, so I put on Oh, you made a lot me of, just feel like, old because I was already in like high school and I think when the Cheetah Girls stuff came out. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, no, you are a youngin. Um, <laughs> age is just a number. And I, I remember <laughs> just, I just loved it. It just like, I know, I, I know everyone probably has something that makes them the happiest. And for me, it was like, first, it's giving back and second, it's dance. Um, so I had waited for it for so long. And I also knew that, you know, it's such a big privilege in a way that I get to do activities, um, like after school activities, because I know some students, I just always was aware that it is an opportunity that I get to dance, you know, because I know some parts of the world or even like next door, some kids don't get that opportunity. And I try to just be as positive as I could be. Like maybe I'm given this challenge so I can learn persistence and really test my kindness. Um, so down the road in my life, if I were to face with a bigger challenge, I would have had those skills. Um, and I, and there were a lot of girls, like you mentioned, who who did quit, who who uh, did quit dance. And I and I saw several of my friends quit dance. And by the time I got to the highest level of dance in my school there was only seven of us left and we started with a group of 30. Mm. So, Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, the strong, the cream rises to the crop, right? Or the cream rises uh, to the top, the cream of the crop, the cream. Yeah. You know what the saying is, right? Yeah. I, and, <laughs> the and, cream <laughs> rises to the top. There we go. Um, well, if you know, you could go back and tell those bullies anything, what would you tell them? Um, a lot of them honestly have reached out to me and um, apologized for what happened. And I feel really thankful for that. And I think just from their changed behavior, because I was just recently back in my hometown um, for the Moonlight Parade where I was there with you. And I remember telling you that, oh, like I'm going to see some people who gave me some of the most tough times of my life. And that's not always the easiest thing. But I think the best thing I can do is just choose to love them and just say, Hey, how are you? How's life going? And, um, just have a genuine heart to heart conversation. There's nothing I would say. I mean, unless we're having a deep conversation with them, like if I'm talking to them for a, like a more than just a small talk, then maybe I'll mention to them that it was really hurtful what they did. And if I would probably just ask if they were realizing that or, cause I think deep down everyone does realize what they're doing um, if it's right or wrong, but I think they people get carried away by being the popular kid or just popularity of that moment um, that they, you know, choose to uh, hurt someone. But deep down, I know everyone knew what they were doing. So, but yeah, I, I would just, you know, smile and just choose love at that moment and just say, what's up? How's your life? Yeah. Oh, I love that. I think that's such a big li- life lesson, especially for somebody that's so young I think of you as young. What you're 21, 22? I just turned 22 this okay, year. Yeah, just turned 22, and mm-hmm. that's such a good life lesson to earn, learn early on. I, I didn't learn about you know just treating everyone with love and kindness and really just feeding that back to them until probably mm-hmm. my later 20s, and that's a whole another story of how I yeah. was able to overcome like my anger with my father. But that's something else. So right. I love that that you learned that so early on in life. Thank um, you. I would love to kind of fast forward a little bit. I mean, still talking about school, but now let's talk about college. And you've okay. been able to study at three different Ivy League institutions and you're a full-time student at the University of Washington. You know, mm-hmm. I want to know, how did you get involved with studying at both Hale, Yale, Harvard, and Stanford? Um, you know, what did those programs look like for you and how were you able to do it all and be a full-time student at <laughs> UW? <laughs> Wow, what a great question. <laughs> Sorry, um, I loaded one. <laughs> yeah, I love it, though. I I really, I, I remember at a very young age when I found out what Harvard or what Ivy League education was, um, I just knew that I really 
wanted to put myself in a challenging situation and with students who had because like I feel like the preparation for these colleges starts in middle school or starts in high school like you have to start taking honors classes and AP classes and which is advanced placement classes um, and start building those skills of discipline and um, time management at a young age so you are able to be competitive for college so I had that dream starting ninth grade of um, going to those universities like Harvard, Yale, Stanford. And then I ended up being waitlisted, which basically means that you're good enough to get in, but we gave someone else your, like gave, like the spots for the class is filled. Um, so if someone, you know, decides not to come to our university or defers admission, then we'll do like a big, rolling system and um, then randomly pick students off off the wait list to get in. Um, so I, I, I was not one of those random, um, I was not randomly selected, but that's fine because I'm studying at University of Washington right now and I'm loving every second of it. So when I was, when I heard about the opportunity where you could be a visiting student at these Ivy League Institute, then I was like, yes, why not? I've been, I would love to, if I, if I can't go to these university all four years and, but I can still go to these universities for a quarter or a semester, I will love to take the opportunity. So yeah, um, I actually, the year before I started college at UW, I went to Harvard University. So my first day of college, my first like college experience was at Harvard. And I remember that day so vividly. Um, and I, I really enjoyed it. I, you know, you really doubt yourself um, when you're going to these universities that am I going to be smart enough? Will I understand what my professor is saying with other kids? Would I be able to carry a conversation with the other students in class? But honestly, you can. Like, you are worthy enough, you are capable enough, um, and it all depends on how much, you know, you have to definitely put in time in, in these classes, but also you need to have that mindset that, yes, we're all created equal, and so, so, some, even even professionals one day, even pro- professors one day were a, a student, you know? So I'm, I'm going there to learn, and um, I put in so much time in my classes, and I, and I was able to... Um, like at the end of the quarter, we had some banquets and I and I got, like at Stanford, I got like number one startup for an idea that I created. And at Harvard, I, I got an award for like asking the best questions in class. So it was kind of, yeah. it was, it was really cool. It was a, a really cool experience. And um, I'm so thankful for it. I like that. I didn't even know that Ivy League <laughs> institutions had those sort of programs where you could come and study for right. a brief period of time rather than attending, say, mm-hmm. all four years there or, or right. what have you. I feel like that's so, pardon the um, reference, but like so legally blonde when she like pulls up <laughs> to class and she's like, come on, bruiser, let's go to class. You're so, right. Sorry, it's just one of my favorite movies and it always shaped me watching Legally Blonde when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you were to give some advice to other students about not only being a student and competing in pageants or whatever, because what if somebody doesn't want to compete in pageants, but you know, just, I guess in doing it all, like what would be your piece of advice for having your hand in so many endeavors? Right. I would say, why not? You have one life and you get to choose what kind of life you want to have. So, and honestly, you can do it. You can, you can be a college student or you can pursue being a doctor and still do pageantry. Or if, if, if you're not that passionate about pageantry, like both of us are, and you're passionate about something else, do that. If you want to do sports, if you want to learn a new hobby, like martial arts, like I want to do that this summer. I want to learn martial arts, like do it. And, um, don't, don't limit yourself. Um, I, I remember being very young and I, like saw all these dance teachers, um, and I aspired to be as such a, as as a great dancer as they were. Um, but it always made me sad because they never like took their um, dance and like did like auditions or like followed their true aspiration because they felt like they were kind of scared about following their true aspiration. They were nervous about what their family might think or if it's too risky or if I'm sacrificing too much. So. I, I say, please go for it. And um, you will learn along the ways how to manage your time. Like you will teach yourself how to manage your time and you'll become more self-aware on what you can handle. Like I'll be mindful of your health and sleep, 
but go for it. Yeah. I like that, that you'll learn how to manage your time. You know, people always say, oh, I'm too busy to do this or, oh, I'm too busy for that. But a quote actually from my husband, he's always like, you make time for the things you value. So, you know, if people say like, oh, I don't have time for to work out. Like if you value it enough, you'll make the time, even if it's 15 minutes in the gym every day or, or whatever, like, you know, or if it's with their kids, like people make the time to spend time with their kids if that's high enough on their priorities list. So he always says that to me if I'm like, I quit back with like, I don't have time to do that. And he's like, you have time for what you want. I'm like, mm, you're so right. We darn it. Like, anyway, why yeah. we love our people in our lives. Right. And you know, it's funny. Yeah. He actually just started doing a martial arts class. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember if you guys talked about that the other no, week we and did it. Like, but we did it. yeah he just started doing taekwondo because it was one of those things where he was like i have always wanted to take a martial arts class <laughs> but i can't do it i'm too old or this and that. i was like yeah you can why not and he was like you're right why not <laughs> so he found an adult taekwondo class yeah that's awesome i'm yeah. so excited I'll, maybe i should practice with him when i come right, down you guys to can you. go sparring i don't even know if that's <laughs> what it's called i don't know <laughs> but anyway so um I want to, again, kind of like I like to say fast forward, but it's not really that long of a fast forward because mm -hmm. just last year in 2017, you first won the title of Miss India Washington. So for background on that, you do have to be of Indian descent in order to compete in that program, correct? Yeah. So it's just half of your, um, you just have to be at least half Indian. Okay. So you won Miss India Washington, which allowed you the path to go and compete at Miss India USA, which was held last year in New York. So mm -hmm. tell me about that experience. I mean, you won a right. national title and you brought home <laughs> a national title to Washington State. Um, what was the most trying part of competing at a national pageant? So at nationals, there were 50 girls. They were 50 of the most talented, smart, intelligent girls um, from all around USA. So when you're put in that situation with 50 other girls, you kind of doubt yourself and you think, am I good enough? Um, and there was girls that I knew who had been competing in their state pageants, like Miss India New York, for a while um, in order to you know, have an entry to Miss India USA. And some of them, it was their last year competing. Like they were 27 years old and um, that's the cutoff. And the new cutoff this year is 28. Um, so I kind of just had to remind myself that I had prepared myself. I almost every weekend I was practicing leading up to missing the USA every day. I was, you know, going through questions, probably not every day, but like every day I was doing some kind of preparation for missing the USA. And it was actually the week of my final. So I talked to my professor and I finished my finals a week earlier so I could, you know, have a week of just focused preparation. So to just remind myself that I had been preparing. And even though, like, I was competing against 50 girls from all around USA that, like, at the end, like, like I'm worth it. I'm worth the title. And I, and I knew in my heart that I really wanted the title to give back and to expand my nonprofit that focuses on a few different issues. So I knew that I genuinely wanted the title to, be, to make the most difference. And I just wanted that message to be given to the judges through my performance, through every part of the competition. I just wanted that to be the message. So I think they heard the message because clearly I you won. <laughs> So, uh, just, I think mentally, I think that's, I think, I bet you can, every pageant girl can say that, that you had to just mentally prepare yourself the most. Well, and that speaks a lot to your character that you went to your professors and said, can I do my finals early? Most people wouldn't say that. They would say, maybe can I do my finals after or wait a week or whatever, but that shows a yeah. lot about your, your attitude and your, yeah, I think level of commitment to school as well as the program of pageantry itself to, to do that early. So con or kudos to you for that. <laughs> um, now you get to go on and compete at Miss India worldwide. And that's a, a basically an international pageant for the title of Miss India. What are the biggest ways that you're preparing for that level of competition? Um, well, I'm doing several things. First, I, um, just trying to be the best Miss India USA possible. And I think being Miss India USA 
kind of prepares me the most of another title. So I'm doing a bunch of appearances, um, which equals like, like just last, like two weeks ago, I was in, I was invited to New Jersey to um, host a singing show for fifty some contestants from all around U.S. and Canada. So that helps me a lot with like the interview aspect of the Miss India World wide pageant and also the confidence aspect of it when I was put on stage and I had to run a whole show for six hours and then I'm also working on my platform um just like I mentioned I was with the Renton um mayor and and then I actually got to go lunch with his secretary and we were at this restaurant and um I was taking pictures with the restaurant owners and this guy comes up to me and he just hands me a check for my nonprofit because he had known about my title, because I had done so many appearances in Seattle. And um, he said, I went on your website, and I've been meaning to email you. And he just went, goes in his cars and gives me a check. Um, so I was like, wow. Like, I, so I just, I think the best way I'm preparing is putting myself out there in the community, getting out of my comfort zone, and like, having a presence where people know that, yes, I would love to speak at your venues. I would love to partner with your nonprofit. And um, I think that's the best way you can prepare for the pageant. And also like the other aspects of gown. Um, I'm getting my gown designed by um, MacDougall. Oh, oh, <laughs> and- <laughs> He's like my favorite gown designer. That and Sherry Hill. It's like they can do no wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah. So excited for that. Um, and I, for my dance, I'm just, even last night I was working on my dance and just like, um, learning new tricks, learning new steps and, um, just having fun with it. Yeah. So those are some of the ways I'm excited for you. So you've been talking about your platform a little bit as well as your nonprofit. Um, what are both of those? What is your platform and how does it coincide with your nonprofit? Ooh, perfect. I love this question. My favorite question. Um, so my nonprofit is called shrisani.org. It's very simple because you can, it's my website's name. Um, so when I knew I could do that, I was like, that's going to be the name of my nonprofit. Um, so it focuses on three major um, causes that are close to my heart, but I'm also open to other causes and other nonprofits that want to partner with me because every cause deserves to be heard and deserves to be worked on. Um, but for me personally, having that pacemaker, I, um, I actually flew to Dallas um, like last month and I partnered with American Heart Association. I've, I had partnered with them before, but I, this time I finally got to meet the CFO and the heads of the organization. And they have over 100,000 volunteers and they have so many thousands of clubs around um, USA. So um, I work on heart health. That's the number one cause. And um, the second platform that I work on is um, anti-bullying because of my life story of, you know, being bullied and coming out of that and not, yeah. So I write for newspapers. I have wrote over 300 articles that kind of explain my situation, what I went through and how I became positive in those challenging times and Right now, I'm writing for five major newspapers around U.S. to um, really help people, um, you know, who might be going through something or could be an assistance to their friends who are going through, like, a tough time. Because it's not just bullying, because I think we can sometimes be our biggest bully. So it's it's kind of called emotional health, like, because I believe our schools and just our – there's a, there's a shift that's happening, but – society focuses on physical health more than emotional health so my second platform is emotional health um and then my third one is anti-human trafficking and that's something I have been working towards since I was in middle school since the first time I learned what trafficking was um that was actually the same year I got my pacemaker so in seventh grade and um I was really shaken up by the fact that there's still modern day slavery and people aren't really talking about it. It seems like people aren't talking about it online or in the news. Um, so I was like, I need to be that change in this situation. So um, I've been raising money for different shelters um, since since then. Yeah. So those are my three major platforms. And uh, yeah, those are fantastic. And I, I 
think too people would be shocked at how much human trafficking in particular happens in the states sometimes i think we become Mm -hmm. so sheltered to it as americans and we think oh it only happens in third world countries or you know across the border and it's not Mm -hmm. just in those situations i mean just i think last summer there was a big human trafficking ring that was busted here in my hometown of tri-cities and it really brought the issue home to me like wow this is happening even here and it's Mm -hmm. it's such an injustice and i'm so glad that you're bringing light to a otherwise shadowed industry Mm -hmm. so thank you thank you so much i love hearing about yeah people really think it's in it thank you yeah so a few little um side topics continuing I guess along the road of pageantry but today the Miss America organization actually announced that they are doing away with their swimsuit portion and I'm just eager to hear what are your thoughts especially in the Miss India program I don't think there is a swimsuit portion no. is that correct so what are yeah. your thoughts do you like it hate it love it <laughs> I love it I really do um I think being a title holder is all about who you are as a person and what you stand for and what causes you care about and what is your plan? Like, how do you plan to grow, um, like your pageant? Like, how do you plan to grow like Miss India USA? Or how do you plan to make a difference in your community? Like, why should we choose you as a leader? Um, and I love that Miss America and both Miss India USA focus on that, those issues, um, and focuses on like, those platform and how we can make a positive impact. And, um, I think a lot of my friends, cause I love pageants. So I talk about them all the time. So when I try to recruit my friends to pageant, like they're really hesitant to join because of that swimsuit portion. So I think this will like, um, encourage girls, more girls to participate. And also, um, I like on my day to day life, I'm never, doing anything in a swimsuit because of my title like none of my Miss America local title holders are doing anything with the swimsuit after they get the title um they only do the swimsuit during the pageant so I I feel like um it's not really needed to get the title if that makes sense um and I do know some people that say like swimsuit competition really helped me to like you know, create a better lifestyle and amen to that. Cause I remember when I competed, like, and even right now when I'm competing, I'm more mindful of like what I'm eating and if I'm working out and if I'm really making the good choices, um, on a day-to-day basis. But I also think that you can have that same kind of discipline, um, with or without the swimsuit. Like I don't have a swimsuit in Miss India worldwide or Miss India USA, but the fact that I'm just going to be on stage and I want to like look good on stage or just like be a good role model. Um, I think that's just going to push me to be in the best shape of my life. Um, regardless of there being a swimsuit. It's a good way to look at it. I like that. I'm going to actually do a separate podcast on my opinion of the Miss America <laughs> situation. I have my own thoughts about it. I mean, I'm I'm still, like I said, kind of processing all the information. So before I do the podcast, I want to come to a clear cut decision on what my opinion is on it. Because I've done both. I've done pageants where I was, in a, I was a Miss America local title holder. I was Miss Columbia Basin back in the day. So I had to compete in a swimsuit. And then I've done pageants like Mrs. America where we wear a swimsuit, but it's one piece. And then even at, well, I guess at Mrs. Washington, it was a one piece. And then at Mrs. America, it was a, a two piece tankini. And on me, I've got a long torso. So it, it, it looked more like a two piece than <laughs> a one piece anyway. So I've got my thoughts on that. Um, but moving on to other topics off of that, I, I know there's some exciting projects in the work for you this summer. Would you be willing to share some of those endeavors that you're going to be taking on this summer? Oh, yes. I'm an open book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so this summer, I'm really looking forward to um, answering a lot of the questions that I get messaged in. I've gotten so many questions about my read and uh, my platform and what I went through. Um, so I really want to make videos on each of those questions and um, keep them short, simple, um, but really have them have a lot of depth in, in it. So um Yeah, so creating that YouTube channel, and second, I am traveling a lot, like I'm going to Maryland, Ohio, um, Chicago, McDougal, what's up? Um, And uh, so I'm making some really 
big like appearances. Um, one of them is with like 40,000. No, I think it's 80,000 doctors. Um, what? so, Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. And then didn't I hear that you're also headed to India? Yes, you heard right. When are you going um, there? When? Yes. Um, I, I think it's going to be, um, like end of August, um, to early September. Um, so being of Indian, being from India and being of Indian descent, I have gotten a lot of people. Um, I mean, I moved to the U S when I was five years old, but I guess some people still remember me like being in kindergarten and being in dance when I was little. So a lot of, um, people from my like hometown, home state really want me to come and do interviews there because they're just so proud that they're like, Punjabi girl one missing a USA. Um, so Ooh, what does that word mean? I, 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 so I'm from this state Punjab. So I'm like Punjabi. Oh, um, so okay. I remember like even after um, getting crowned missing a USA, like people were just like, oh my gosh, I went to kindergarten with her or I was her kindergarten teacher. Um, the news spread everywhere in India. And um, there was reporters that like knocked on my grandparents' door uh, with like sweets and biscuits and like um, gifts and my my grandparents were like known in my town they they were called um, India USA's grandparents proud and they had a huge Aww. interview um, so a lot of people have been very supportive to me and I feel so honored and thankful and I was also on BBC Hindi and the fact that I can speak the language um, like four languages it makes them really excited because I can be on different like news channels and really just relate to them more culturally. So um, they've been inviting me and everyone keeps messaging me because like if I go to Dallas and I like put in a geo filter of Dallas in my Instagram, people are constantly like, but when are you coming to India though? So Aww. I'm excited to finally be able to like make uh, a trip down to India and um, so, you know, hit, hit some people up in Bollywood. That'd be cool too, to make some connections there. That'd be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Keep me posted. I can't wait to hear more about that. You know, and Thank speaking you. of, you know, such a supportive group and, and family, whether it's your extended family down in India or your family here, I've always been so impressed with your parents and your core family values. Uh, like I said, I competed Thank with you. your mom last year at Mrs. Washington and she is competing again this year for the title of Mrs. Washington. And she even won, you know, most supportive pageant parent at a, a recent award program called the global beauty awards back in March. But anyway, what yes. has been your favorite part about having your parents so involved with your endeavors and pageants? I love being able to share my reign with them. Um, my brother, he, uh, studies at New York university and he's so, um, supportive and he like he he's so protective of all the offers I get um so I like love the fact that I can discuss it with my parents because I've gotten offers to like be in a bachelorette like be an Asian bachelorette um and it's like kind of like a it was like a week by week episode um so they're just like they like keep guard out on what what projects I should focus on um in this reign and um my I love like having my dad come to appearances um it's like just just this past weekend I was with Mrs. Gates Mimi Gates which is Bill, Date, Bill Gates mom um and my my parents are so funny because they get so nervous and I'm like hi um this is my dad and this is my mom Mrs. Mrs. Gates and they get so nervous and I'm like there's nothing to be nervous about you're you created me in the USA like yeah <laughs> yeah I so that. I love um and I and I honestly could not have done this train without my mom my mom has c continues to and constantly has pushed me to take on challenges of different jobs that I get as Miss New USA like like I mentioned hosting that um reality tv show that was not easy to do and that was something I've never done like hosted a show so I'm so thankful that my mom like pushes me and um, and can, she kind of hypes me up. She's my hype queen. Like, of She's course you can do it. Why not? <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm really thankful that they, they, that they support me and, um, and I, yeah, I, I feel really lucky to have them. Well, I, I've been blessed to have both of them in my life too. So they're just amazing people. <laughs> 
So, we love you. <laughs> All things. Um, as we kind of wrap up here, I have some rapid fire questions that I'd like to kind of work through and then um, give you a chance to share where people can find you. So my first one is, what are your top three core values? Ooh, um, my first one would be equality because um, I think everyone's created equal and I try to make decisions based on, you know, like treating everyone equally and also helping to give equal opportunities to people who might not have had opportunities growing up. Um, my second one I would say is love in action. So really choosing love over and over again. And third one, I'll say respect, like respecting that you have to, respecting work, respecting the fact that you kind of have to work or respecting um, just other people as well. Just having respect for what you're doing and for other people. And even respect for yourself. I love that. <laughs> Are there any, yeah. or what would be your number one recommendation of a resource that you've been loving lately, whether it is a book, a podcast, an audio book mm -hmm. or a video series? What have you been using as your biggest resource right now? So I love self-help books. Um, I feel that if you pick any self-help book, you will walk away with learning a couple dozen things. So I really care about, like, I, I grew up reading self-help books. So any self-help books that you can pick, um, I say pick it and apply the things you're learning from it. Love it. And even like go back and reread it. I, that's been me right now. I listened to find your why or no, it starts with why by Simon Sinek. And I, I'm going back through and like re-listening to it. Cause I'm like, okay, there's even more I need to pick up. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> and then my last big question is very open to interpretation, but I ask it to all my guests. So what does it mean to do things with style and grace? Ooh. So for me, I um, will take style and grace as how you respond to others. Um, so are you having like graceful, mature, stylistic, kind of like light and funny responses to people? So in that, I mean like are you um, like staying strong in your values and also not like like having fun with your life? being graceful in who you are, but also having fun with your life and your responses and your actions that you take on a day-to-day -day basis. I love that. That's a good way to take it. Very different than Thank you. everybody's answers are always so different. So I'm always eager to hear what people have to say <laughs> for that question. <laughs> and then that. my listeners, I'm sure they're eager to find you and follow you. So where can they find your website, your social media accounts and find and follow you in a good way, not a stalker way. <laughs> Oh, I love making new friends. So um, when you do follow me, do message me, say hi. Um, so my Instagram is Miss India USA underscore Shree Siani. I like having one Instagram, so um, from both my title and who I am. And for my Facebook, I just have a personal Facebook account right now, so you, you can follow me and or I can add you back. Um, just message me so I know to do so. And my website is shreesandy.org. And you can directly email me at shree at shreesandy.org. I love that. And just so listeners are aware, her name is spelled S-H-R-E-E. -E, so Shree Sani. S-A-I-N-I. -I, is that correct? Perfect. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I am sure that my listeners have loved getting to know you, as have I over the past year or a little over a year now. So just thank you so much, Shree, for coming on the podcast today. Thank you so, so much for having me. It's been my pleasure. Hey, ladies, thanks for listening. And we hope you enjoy today's episode. To help empower more women, please be a doll and rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes and other free resources we mentioned today, go to stylebydeidra.com.